Hey, what's happening guys? Today is a little quick video on five tips for better soldering. And like it says, they're not in a, any particular order, okay? So my first tip is to make sure that your surfaces are clean. And that includes like both the legs and the pads. I mean, if you're doing on, working on something new, basically you can get one of these solder flux pens and you know just wipe it on there and that'll clean it up pretty good. But if you have something you're trying to solder and the flux isn't cutting it, my next be best recommendation are Scotch-Brite pads. You just get them, you know, just lightly scuff it up a little bit and then hit it again with the flux and you should be pretty good. My next tip is to use a temperature controlled soldering iron. Now over here we have the old style soldering iron that you just plug into the wall and you wait till it heats up. They work. There's, I mean, we've used them for years. There's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. The problem is you have no control over how hot they get, and they get pretty hot. And if you leave them on and they get too hot, well, you burn the coating off the tip and you can't restore it. You end up buying new tips and you know what? By the time you've gone through all of this, now you can get one of these irons for say, you know, $20 American. By the time you've messed with all of this, you're better off to have spent about a hundred bucks up front and pick up a temperature controlled soldering iron so you can put the uh, the heat just a little bit hotter than what's needed to melt the solder, but not so hot that you're going to interfere with components function or burn them up. That's one of the things I always talk about when I talk about soldering is especially when working on ICs, you are better off to hit the joint with more heat for a shorter amount of time than less heat for a longer amount of time called dwell time. You want your dwell time to be as small as possible because it's, it's a function of the two that damages components. Next is use quality solder. Now I just put MG chemicals on here. I'm not endorsing them. You can use whatever company you want. If you're in uh, the US or a country that allows lead solder, then I recommend 6040. You can also get well, what's the other one? 6337, but I like 6040. I like 025 or 032. And you can see this flux core, 2.2% flux. You definitely want flux core when working with electronics. That roll plumbing solder you've got in your toolbox over there is not going to cut it. It's too big. It doesn't have the right core. You know, you can get a half pound of this for 15, 20 bucks. Now, if you're outside the U.S., or in a country that you know prohibits the use of leaded solder, then you're going to end up getting you know, some lead-free solder. And what you're going to find is this is going to be 96.3% tin, which is fine. 0.7% copper, which has a much, much, much higher melting point. And 3% silver, which also has a much higher melting point. I'm not going to make any judgments about lead-free solder. I don't use it enough to make a difference. I've used it. It works. If I'm forced to use it, I can do it. My, my choice would be the lead-free if you can get it. Um, use the thinnest solder possible for the job with the widest tip on your soldering iron. That way you're getting the most heat into the joint, again, in the least amount of time. Next, fixture your soldering projects wherever possible. This here is the uh, the old school helping hands, it was called, you know, this little, little weight thing here, this movable joint alligator clips. This over here is the more modern version of it. It just uses these stiff, flexible cables. I have one of these and it works, but I find it's too high off the desk for me, which is why I don't use it all the time. And if you're soldering PCBs, Definitely get yourself one of these PCB holders. They spin around and make the job easy. But, you know, with um, resistors, capacitors, and such, you can bend the legs on the back side of the board so they stay in place. But when you're working with components you can't do that with, then I recommend electrical tape. Painter's tape, scotch tape, it's all good. Just tape it down to the board until you get one or two legs soldered and you're good to go. I know a lot of you guys in the UK use blue tack. Uh, that's called like poster sticky or something over here. I've never tried it. I'll have to give it a try and see how it works. So I, 
I can't pass any judgment on that. And finally, know what a good solder joint looks like. This right here is a good solder joint. It looks like a mountain. The entire pad is covered and it's shiny. That is the look you want. You don't want this. That's, that's just a glob. Again, another glob. This is okay, but I would prefer to see the entire thing cased in solder. Here, you can see the entire pad is not covered. That'll work loose. Again here, that's, I mean, that's, that's barely in there at all. That's going to work loose. Now, this is a good joint. I mean, a cold joint. What this means is that that wire is poking in the middle there is not really connected to that solder, and that solder is not really connected to that pad. You're not going to get a good electrical connection out of that, even though it may provide a mechanical connection. You might be able to pull on it and it won't move, but the electrical connection is not going to be good. And then we have kind of the same thing over here. So those are things to keep a lookout for. Know what your joint should look like. It should look like a mountain, a shiny mountain, and you'll be good to go. All right, that's all I got for you. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please give me a thumbs up. Feel free to comment, share, and don't forget to subscribe. Big thanks to all the patrons, and a big thanks to you guys for watching. That's it. I'm out. Peace.